Good evening. I want to welcome you to East Hampton Media's 2017 School Committee Forum. I'm Mike Tausnick, um, and I'll be moderating tonight's event for you. I'd like to thank the 2017 candidates um, for joining us. Thank you very much. Those that can, they'll be, we'll have one candidate who's going to phone in um, and another candidate who is unable to participate. Um, I want to thank the constituents for your questions. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, and I really want to thank everyone for engaging in this very important political process that we're going through. Tonight's event is broadcast um, on cha live on channel 191 and channel 193 uh, if you're on, uh, on the charter cable system. And it's being live streamed over East Hampton Media's Facebook uh, page, so you can click it there. Um, and it's also going to be posted online at our website, easthamptonmedia.org. Tonight, each question, I mean, each candidate will be asked questions that have been previously submitted by the community members or other stakeholders, and I will let you know where the question came from when I, when I ask it. Candidates, feel free to ask me to repeat questions if, uh, if it, you know, you've listened to two or three and you don't really remember for sure what the question is, that's fine. This is right, so uh, it's really up to you. Um, each, uh, um, well, we're going to have a speakeasy after this at Mill 180. And so those of you that are here joining us live, uh, please feel free to ask your questions then. Um, and so we're not asking for any audience participation during this forum. Um, it's at 8.30, and it's Mill Park 180 on Pleasant Street. And uh, it should be a great venue for this. Um, and the speakeasies have gone over really well. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have a conversation, to talk about the issues that you've heard about. It is not an opportunity for the candidates to participate, although they're certainly welcome. We invite you, and we ask you to listen. Each candidate tonight is going to give, be given two minutes for opening statements, um, and then we're going to ask several questions of the candidates. We've already had a bit of a discussion. We're going to start opening statements on one end of the table. We're going to start closing statements, uh, which is a one-minute statement at, the, at this other end of the tables. And I'm going to try to remember to rotate the first question so everyone gets a shot at being the first person to answer the questions. Um, and I'm sorry if the question you get is your first one isn't one that you really wanted as your first one. <laughs> So now I'm pleased to introduce the candidates in no particular order. Um, Jonathan Schmidt. Jonathan was raised in East Hampton and attended the public schools from kindergarten through his graduation from East Hampton High School. He graduated from UMass Amherst with a degree in communications. And through Simmons um, and information, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan holds a master's degree in library and information services through Simmons College and serves as the youth services librarian at the Emily Williston Memorial Library here in town. Jonathan views his work at the library as an important opportunity to engage and empower the current generation growing up in East Hampton. He has met and served countless children and parents during his time at the library, and he frequently works with teens to plan and run events that enrich the lives of local families. He has continued a tradition of collaboration between East Hampton teachers and the public library by regularly holding class visits, while also working with school administrators and other community figureheads on larger scale projects, such as East Hampton's Book Fest. These experiences all add up to a perspective that will account for the needs of everyone involved in our school system, while offering open communication and inclusive leadership to the community at large. Jonathan Schmidt. Marin Goldstein. Marin Goldstein is 44 and a resident of East Hampton for the last seven years. Marin holds a master's in education, has, has experience leading environmental education and international science and cultural exchange programs, as well as working with at-risk youth. He currently works as a project manager for Trinity Solar in Hoyoke. Marin chairs the Energy Advisory Committee. Thank you for continuing that. Um, is on the current school building committee and volunteered as a kid's soccer coach for several years. Marin is seeking to join the East Hampton School Committee to bring his passion for strong schools with safe and engaging academic programs. 
He believes that the path forward is to increase community involvement and dialogue in regards to diversity and safety issues in our schools. He wants to improve relations and the utilization of school community groups, for example, school councils, parent teachers organizations, and special education parent groups, and envisions a brighter future for our schools with a new pre-K building. Thank you, Mayor. Cynthia Kwasinski. Cynthia Kwasinski is a special education teacher at Smith Academy in Hatfield, Mass. She is running for re-election as her second term on the school committee. During her first two years, she was the chair of the finance subcommittee. She worked on the negotiation team for the new contract, and she was the collaborative representative from the district. Her priorities for the next two years are to monitor and improve the implementation of the 10-point plan to heal the district and bring the school community together to continue to work forward getting a new K building approved and to continue to bring more school choice dollars back to East Hampton. Cynthia. Marissa Carey. Marissa Carey is the current member of the school committee. Marissa is a parent to a Maple fourth grader and a toddler and she teaches courses on writing, policy, and democratic theory at Bard Micro College, Hoyoke, and UMass Amherst. As chair of the policy subcommittee, Marissa has been leading initiatives to modernize district policy. policy um, and she has been advocating for state legislation to support public education in East Hampton and beyond. She is running for re-election to bring her experience and proactive approach to the committee in the important years ahead, as the district undergoes cultural transformation and as we ask city voters to support the exciting and smart investment in a new pre-K-8 building. Marissa. Lori Garcia. Lori grew up in Sharon, Massachusetts. She holds a bachelor's in human development from the University of Vermont and a master's in intercultural relations from Leslie College. Lori has extensive experience working, researching, and teaching in Spain, and met her husband, Eugenio, there. While in Spain, she provided support services for international students and public, published the first guide, bilingual in Spanish and English, for international students at a Spanish university. Over the past 25 years, Lori has taught English as a second language and Spanish to students in both private and public schools. She was the International Student Coordinator and Act Academic Testing Supervisor at the Williston Northampton School. In the 90s, she directed and taught after-school nonprofit Spanish classes for K through six students in East Hampton and other towns. Lori currently teaches Spanish at West Springfield High School, was a founding member of the Manhattan Rail Trail Committee, and is chair of the East Hampton Democratic Committee. Lori. Alexandra Lynn Dodge will be joining us by telephone. And I think the viewers at home will see a photograph of her. <laughs> Alexandra was raised in the Midwest and educated in the public school system. She has a bachelor's of science and is certified to teach English at the high school level. She has spent more than a decade working in educational publishing, followed by another decade with a multinational software company where she remains employed. Alexandra and her husband made East Hampton their chosen community in 2011 and have since grown to a family of four. Their older daughter starting at center school just this year and a second daughter to follow. Alexandra sends her regrets that she is unable to attend this evening's event in person as she is attending her brother's wedding out of state and invites you to visit her fake Facebook page to connect directly. And we're going to try to fit, uh, once I understand that the connections are all set and we can hear her, we're going to try to fit her in uh, to the cycle. Um, and likely we'll start at the very end of this piece, so she'll be the last to open. We're not going to be able to do it. Alexandra will not be joining us tonight. Another candidate who cannot join us tonight is Rose Spurgeon. <coughs> I'm Rose Spurgeon, well, I'm not, um, <laughs> and, and she is running for school committee, as you gathered. Um, she grew up in Franklin County and has been in, in East Hampton for three years. Her two youngest sons attend kindergarten and first grade at Maple, 
and they live in Cottage Square. She was inspired to run for, a, for school committee because she believes it's, crucial, it's a crucial year for our schools. Her background is in agriculture and insurance, and she is a special needs parent. She says she loves our small city, and she is excited to experience its continued growth. Shannon Dunham. Shannon Dunham was born and raised in nearby Southampton and moved to the East Hampton community to raise her two daughters. She earned an associate's degree in business administration and is employed as a UTC account specialist at Aerospace Alloys in Bloomfield, Connecticut. She quickly established herself as a vital member of local organizations supporting East Hampton's youth, including as vice president of Youth Cheer for seven years and as an active participant in East Hampton Friends of Football Association. She also volunteered for eight years as an area leader for the Girl Scouts of America. She produced for East Hampton Parent Council's presentation of East Hampton High's drama club, Grease, and Kiss Me Kate. She is also a vibrant member of the parents and students for East Hampton Public Schools, supporting sensitivity and diversity for all our children. Imperative to Shannon's mission is the support of quality 21st century learning in our local public schools and mutual respect and opportunities for all learners, including minorities and those with disabilities. <clears throat> We're going to start with opening statements and we'll start with Lori. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor Mike. And I'd also like to thank Kathy Lynch and her crew from East Hampton Media. Kathy has worked tirelessly for months trying to inform our citizens about everything going on. So thank you, Kathy. And I'd like to thank you for listening at home and especially you for being here because it's obvious you're invested in our schools. As you heard, I'm Laurie Garcia and I hope to be elected to the school committee in order to put my experience and passion for public education to work for East Hampton. As an educator for more than 25 years, I have taught students of all ages, both Spanish and English as a second language. My husband, Eugenio, and I moved to the town of East Hampton 23 years ago with our daughter, Gabriela, and our son, Alex. Gabriela was two and Alex was two weeks old when we moved. They were reared in our bilingual and bicultural home and although both are working and living out of state, they still consider East Hampton and will always consider East Hampton to be their home. We have all been thrilled with the transition East Hampton has made from a town to a city, including an influx of the arts and the growing cultural diversity new residents bring. Both my master's degree in intercultural relations and my vast experience in a variety of school settings can help East Hampton to continue in this progress and also help our city adhere to the 10 point action plan on school climate and culture. I have decades of experience in advocacy and community service, including being one of the founding members of the Manhattan Rail Trail Committee. Most recently, I helped to lead the fight to keep the cap on charter schools. I would like to garner support in the community to improve our schools, including the promotion of sensitivity to diversity, the building of a new pre-K through eight facility, and ensuring parents and students are satisfied with curricular offerings. Of utmost importance, I am ready to put my experience to work to make East Hampton a model district of inclusiveness and respect for all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shannon Dunham. Um, I'm 42 years old. I live right next door to the high school, which is a wonderful place to be when you have teenage children. Um, I have two daughters. Uh, my oldest is Maya. She graduated from East Hampton High in 2016. Um, and my youngest is Marissa, and she is a junior here at EHS. Um, I got involved in the school committee about six months ago. I started going to the meetings and trying to learn what it's about and what they do, and also to follow through with the things that were happening here at the high school last year. Um, 
I lived in Southampton growing up. Um, I knew that when I was ready to move on and start a family, that Southampton wasn't the place that I wanted to be. Um, East Hampton wasn't quite ready for, um, it was still a town, um, and it wasn't quite ready for my family. Um, my children are biracial, um, and it just wasn't the place that I wanted to raise my children. We moved to West Springfield, where I got involved as a Girl Scout leader um, with the Boys and Girls Club there, and I did that for six years. It, was, it said eight in the bio, I'm not sure why. Um, and I <coughs> also got involved in the youth cheer program in Westside. Um, in 2009, it was time for my daughters and I to move on. Um, we came here, this was our chosen community, um, for its diversity and cultural climate. Um, we bought a home about four years ago. Again, it's right next door and I love living there. Um, I got involved in the youth cheer program as soon as I moved here and I've been doing it for seven years. Thank you, Shane. Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Carreri, and I want to start by also thanking East Hampton Media for hosting this event. And everybody who's here this evening or watching from home, it's so great to see people take an interest in our local elections and in our schools specifically. It's been a privilege to serve on the East Hampton School Committee for the past two years, and I'm excited to be running for re-election. I love our city, and I'm so grateful to be raising my two children in this community and in this district. I believe that our public schools are the heart of our community, and I'm dedicated to advocating for the well-being of the schools and for each and every one of our um, young people here in East Hampton. We have an important term ahead. As a district, we're in the process of making institutional transformations to really ensure a climate that is inclusive and equitable for every student. As a city, we are facing a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build a new pre-K through eight building, which would offer all sorts of 21st century educational amenities. And as a commonwealth, we really need to be advocating for legislation to modernize the foundation budget to make sure that Beacon Hill is providing fair funding to all local public school districts, East Hampton included, of course, and um, to rethink how high stakes standardized testing is affecting teachers and kids. These concerns are important to me and I've been working hard during this term. As an educator myself, I place a lot of value in the work that our district does to nurture the young people of East Hampton so they can be um, successful in careers or in college, whatever might be their pathway, so they can become lifelong learners and so they can be respectful citizens of their community, whether that's East Hampton or communities beyond. Um, if re-elected, I promise to continue to devote myself to promoting the long-term vitality of our district. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Jonathan. I also just want to take a moment to thank Mayor Tostnik for leading us through this evening, uh, to Kathy, the fine folks behind the cameras sharing this with the rest of the world out there, uh, and everyone at East Hampton Media for uh, putting together this event. I'm thrilled to see how much a time and an effort is being put into uh, spreading information from our local election uh, to the citizens of our community. I think it's incredibly important and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. My name is Jonathan Schmidt, uh, as you've learned. Um, as Mayor Mike shared, I attended East Hampton Public Schools from kindergarten through my senior year of high school. I then uh, received my bachelor's in communication from UMass and a master's in library and information sciences through Simmons College. It's my opinion that the strength of our education system uh, is indicative of the success of humanity as a whole. I think our ability to learn and to teach is our most, one of our most defining features. And if that's something that is lacking in our community and in our society, then it, it shows that uh, we are not um, moving forward in, in a sustainable direction. And it's uh, important to me that um, as a part of the school committee uh, to instill that, that thinking 
um, to really embrace education and to make it an important focal point of our, of our lives and, uh, and our community. Uh, I'm the Youth Services Librarian here at the Public Library in town, and um, I've had many folks ask me if I have children. I don't, but I've seen so many children grow up through the library system that I have no shortage of compassion for them and their well-being. And uh, it's, it's so exciting to have the opportunity to um, help them further in their, in their growth and their success. Thank you. Cynthia. Hi. Thanks to everybody who's involved. Um, I do want to say um, it says Cynthia, but I really go by Cindy. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I even put Cynthia in the beginning. Um, I'm running for re-election. Um, I want to tell you a little bit extra about myself. Uh, initially, in the early part of my career, um, I ran a counseling and advocacy program in Greenfield for abused adolescents. It was very fulfilling. Um, but then I had children and decided I wanted to get involved in education. So I went back to school in 1997 and then got certified as a special ed teacher. Since then, I've been working at Smith Academy. Um, and I ran for election two years ago because I really believe that every school committee should have at least one, hopefully one, two, three, school, um, school teachers, public school teachers on the committee. And the reason for that is there's the day-to-day -day, um, understanding of the effect of policies, budgeting, programming, scheduling, even um, the trainings that we give teachers and administrators and our students that I think is really important to bring to any school committee to help guide some of those decisions. So in the last two years, that's really what I thought was probably my greatest contribution to the committee is the ability to look at any issue that we talked about and see it from the perspective of how my students and students that I've dealt with in the past, teachers and administrators would be able to um, respond to that. So that's what I hope to bring the next time. So hopefully I'll get your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Mary. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, thank you to Mayor Mike, thank you to Kathy, to East Hampton Media. I appreciate all the work that you guys do. Um, and for all of you who are coming out and spending, uh, coming for your Friday night evening to come here with us. Um, as I said, my name is Marin Goldstein. I'm running to represent the students and parents of our community on the school committee. Uh, as Mayor Mike said, I have a master's in education. Um, I have a lot of experience leading international science and cultural exchange programs, as well as environmental education. Uh, I currently chair the Energy um, Advisory Committee to the Mayor, where I manage the Green Community Report, uh, as well as raising in 2015 over uh, nearly $350,000 for energy efficiency measures to our school buildings. Um, I chose to move here about seven years ago to raise my son here. Um, he's now a fifth grader at Whitebrook Middle School. Uh, very proud about that. Um, and I'm seeking election because I want to bring my passion for strong schools uh, with an engaging academic program. Um, I have three main goals uh, if I was to be elected. That is to help us move forward to increase more community involvement and dialogue in, reverse, in regards to diversity and safety issues in our schools. I want to improve the collaboration with um, various school groups, things like the school, uh, school councils, PTO, the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee. Um, these groups have tremendous experience and knowledge, and I really think it's important for them to be brought into closer partnership with both the school committee as well as the school administration. Uh, and finally, I envision a brighter future for our schools uh, with a new pre-K through eight program, um, which will be decided by us as voters in May of 2018. Now, looking back over the past year, uh, East Hampton has been driven into the limelight. Between the graffiti on Mount Tom and the incidents in our high school, we've been forced to face the difficult implement, uh, implications of bias and discrimination in our community. As the Attorney General's report stated, the tragic parking lot incident should have been managed by the many little incidents that led up to it. And all four of those students should have been provided support, or were not provided with the support they needed to find alternative ways to manage their differences. We can't shy away from these differences, 
But through dialogue and training, we can, we can all learn skills to learn how to live better together in a diverse world, respectfully. Starting uh, since the start of the year, so much has already been happening to help enrich, in, enrich our high school students, teachers, and administrative staff. I'll talk about more of that later. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We're going to proceed to the questions. Uh, we've sort of decided on our own that we would, uh, we would start at this end of the table, and we will try to rotate the lead for the first question so that everyone gets an opportunity. So this first question will go to Lori. And then you all will have a chance to answer the same question. And as I said earlier, feel free to ask me to read it again. Some of these are kind of long. So this question is from Mindy Jenkins. And it begins with a, 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 a question about understanding, and then it asks something specific. Um, is it your understanding that the new and revised East Hampton Public School District policies and procedures will include a process by which for example, a student who has reported an incident of bias to East Hampton Public School staff will be able to have a facilitated meeting, possibly the same day if warranted, with the alleged perpetrator or perpetrators of the incident of bias. If that is not your understanding, please describe the incident of bias process. I certainly hope that that will be all of our understanding because I think one of the main issues that it has transpired is that there wasn't transparency. There wasn't a way for students to meet and then have that meeting go to people like the school committee. And I think people were blindsided about what was going on. So I certainly hope as part of the 10 point plan there is going to be a policy, and it is, I think it's step five or six. I mean, I could look it up right now, but I have read it and I've studied it. And we're on our way to making sure that we're gonna move forward in the right direction. And I would just like to interject with everything that has happened in East Hampton. It's so unfortunate that we have been in the press, but being in different school districts, including Amherst and West Springfield, these types of negative behaviors are occurring. So we all have to work to curtail them. But I believe, and I certainly, if I am a member of the school committee, will make sure that there is due process with the students and that all of us are aware of it. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, at this time, I don't believe that that was a policy. Um, I understand that it is part of the 10 point program or the 10 point action plan. Um, I think it's imperative that there is a meeting that parents get involved, the students get involved, they sit down together, they have a conversation and there's some sort of restorative justice. Um, I know that for a fact that it did not happen in this case, um, it's very disappointing and if I am on the school committee, I will make sure that that does get put in place. Thank you. Marissa. Yeah, thank you, Mindy, for the question. Um, I do know that part of the 10-point plan establishes a diversity and inclusion officer. And um, the function of that role is really to create a space um, for students where they know they can safely report incidents of incidences of bias. I think one of the issues that students identified in the past was that when things occurred, they weren't quite sure where to go with their concerns. And so um, if implemented well, that officer, the diversity and inclusion officer position should really create a channel for uh, addressing problems as they occur. In terms of whether that will entail immediate facilitated meetings between the students in conflict. Um, I, ultimately, I think that's a great idea. I think the students want to be able to live um, and learn in a school community where they figure out how to overcome those differences that might exist between students. Um, that kind of facilitation it needs to be done sensitive, sensitively and by people with training. It's certainly something that I would be interested in um, talking more about with the school committee and with the school leaders. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I would add is that I think it's also really important to not only be addressing 
um, issues on an incident by incident basis, but to also take some proactive approaches to really give students um, frameworks for understanding um, the need to be sensitive and respectful members of their school community and, um, and methods for overcoming difference between different perspectives and, and different student groups. So for those reasons, I'm glad to see the high school implementing programs like the SPIRIT program, which are precisely designed to um, proactively create some of those, um, that, that kind of knowledge and culture among the student body. And I will, will be supporting additional programming of that type. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I feel like I can't speak to the exact language of the uh, policies and procedures. It is, um, as some of you have already alluded, uh, my understanding that both the 10-point plan and uh, the agreement made with the Attorney General's office um, include uh, an officer in the school uh, who is dedicated to uh, hearing complaints from students uh, regarding uh, discrimination and bias. Um, and. I don't know that uh, it, it will it'll depend on, I think, case by case basis, whether or not that's able to occur um, on the exact day of, of an incident. Um, as, as I said earlier, I have, a, I have a background in communications and a very important um, part of that and something I adopt into my uh, life as a whole is the importance of um, being able to hear everyone's side of a story. Um, even if you know there may be a clear-cut answer to what is going on, uh, it's crucial to make everyone feel as if they are heard, um, and not that you're just hearing their words, but that you're understanding the feelings behind their words. If that doesn't happen, then uh, you're um, not going to be able to get um, folks to see the opinions of others. Um, and I think that that's that's something that's going to be really difficult for us moving forward is getting, uh, getting folks to see the opinions of others that um, they're not familiar with. So um, I'm very much in support of having this, this staff member in the school. I think that uh, these kids who have felt left behind and ignored need someone who is there to uh, listen to them and, and advocate for them. Uh, and as a, as a member of the school committee, I will absolutely uh, ensure that that part of the plan moving forward is followed. Thanks. Thank you. Cindy. Well, I'm really excited um, that we have the diversity and inclusion officer. Uh, I think that aside from writing policies about what that position will entail, this position promises to be something that will grow. And um, I, I see it as something that could be a shining light um, for other school districts. I'm really excited about this position. I'm hoping and I believe that the person who's initially um, starting this position is very creative, um, empathetic and respectful and understands the needs of these kids. I love the idea of bringing the two kids together to talk. I'm not sure that can always happen on the same day. Um, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis, but hopefully, and I believe this to be true, the officer is going to be able to see and make those decisions. But I love the idea of very quickly bringing parties together. That's one of the things that I've tried to say as I've gone out in the community is that we need to bring everybody together, both sides of any issue, any argument. We're, we're teaching children how to get along in society. It's really important that we bring them together, even when they're angry, even when they, you know, they have done hurtful things in terms of what they've said to each other, and teach them that there's another way to be. And I'm really excited to see this position. And I do think that that's exactly the kind of um, response that we're going to have. Thank you. Mary. So as far as my understanding, this policy is yet to be written. It is part of the 10-point plan. It is something that will be done over this fall and hopefully soon. Um, it, I think, as other people have mentioned, it is very important part of this is that the diversity officer um, is there on a daily basis. 
Um, that position is already currently being internally filled and will continue to uh, probably get more integrated once it's actually hired and into a permanent position. Um, that person both offers informal support as well as formal support. Um, I understand that the different um, forms uh, for disciplinary forms for the administration is also in the process of being changed so that you can actually label things as hate speech if that's what the incident might be about. Um, another important part of this diversity officer's role is going to be working with the students to be creating the advisory group. Uh, that this really going to be what the critical piece there is helping increase the voice of students, uh, both in terms of incidents that may be arising, but also then in terms of the uh, three year plan that's being rolled out um, currently. Uh, and I think that, that that plan is a really great start. Um, and it's also going to take important leadership by the school committee, by the administration, uh, by the teachers, by the students, all of us are going by the community, all of us are going to have to be involved to make sure that that three year plan really helps us look at our own sort of internal biases and how can we help evolve ourselves into 21st centuries where we understand that we live in a diverse world. We have to understand that we have to respect each other and work with each other. Um, and so that may not necessarily, as we've said, not always have that day, uh, but longer term, certainly we have to be able to look to figure out how to live together and work together um, and work through our biases. We all have our biases. Um, I was actually originally born in Vermont. When I moved out to California and San Diego, I was trained by my other students to be racist against Mexicans. I had to learn about that. I had to understand that and change that. And all of us have to understand that about ourselves and be able to move beyond that. Thank you. We'll start the second question with Shannon. This question is from the East Hampton Development and Industrial Commission, and it was submitted to us via Jamie Webb, a staffer in the East Hampton Planning Department. What are your thoughts about the new school development and the use for existing buildings that would be vacated? Sorry, I was just writing. That's okay. I, okay. Can, I can repeat it. Um, I personally think it's a fantastic idea to have an integrated school K through eight. Um, we have four buildings currently, um, one, that isn't as old, but it's definitely not energy efficient. Um, the other three are beautiful buildings. Um, however, they're not up to code. Um, I would like to see them transformed into some type of housing, like they did with the Parsons Street School. Um, I would, I think it's a fantastic idea to integrate the schools in combining resources, um, teachers, special education, um, you know, pro other programs like the arts programs and the music programs. I think it would benefit our city to have all of those things under one roof instead of under four. Thank you. Marissa. Thank you, Jamie, for the question. Um, I am also in full support of the, the plan for a new building. Um, not only does it resolve what are some pretty urgent issues with our facilities, as we do have quite old buildings, some of the oldest in Massachusetts, I think we can boast <coughs> that claim, um, but it provides us with opportunities to um, really provide 21st century education spaces. So that's outdoor green spaces, outdoor classrooms, um, tech equipped classrooms, STEM labs, um, arts and performance and music spaces, all these things that we really want to see our children have, um, have access to in their building. And um, it's a, the superintendent and the school building committee have gone through a tremendous process to apply for the state grant. And that's a, a rare opportunity to have approval toward that grant. Um, we have a chance to take advantage of that state money, so that way the cost is offset. And so economically, it makes a lot of sense for us, um, both in this the immediate upfront cost is will be mitigated by those state funds, but then also looking at the long-term economic benefits to our city as we have more efficient buildings and as we have a really attractive building for uh, young families who might be interested in moving to East Hampton or choosing into our district. Um, in terms of use for the old buildings, 
I think that's a little outside of school committee's jurisdiction. I'm excited to be talking with city councilors and mayoral candidates about their ideas of how we might put those spaces to use. But they certainly are beautiful buildings, and the thing that makes them so difficult to, um, to work with or to revamp for schools uh, is the fact that they're landlocked. Well, that very same problem as um, from the perspective of educators makes them really valuable spaces for the city. I think they're right in the heart of our downtown walking spaces. So I imagine something exciting could happen there. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm gonna continue along the same line. I'm very much in favor of um, consolidating our schools into a new building. Um, Marissa, you pointed out earlier that it's a once in a generation opportunity, and yet here we are with the second opportunity to build a new school building in the past um, decade. And uh, it seems like too great an opportunity to pass up. Um, I know that there's a lot of concern over the cost, um, specifically as it will affect the taxes of homeowners in East Stampton. Um, but if we don't take advantage now, then the cost of a new building in the future, should this grant no longer be available to us, is, is just going to be higher. Um, I approach, um, I try to approach life with an eye to the future. I think it's our responsibility to, uh, as citizens of today, to um, prepare uh, the, the children and the folks of tomorrow to um, be in the best position possible to succeed. And I think that uh, a new school is absolutely the way to, to accomplish that. Um, there's so much that can be done in a classroom to enhance the learning of students besides just a teacher in the front uh, sharing ideas and to, to, to be involved in the, the, the planning of you know, figuring out what could go in those classrooms and um, see it all come to fruition, I think is really exciting. As far as the buildings themselves, I agree. I don't think that it's um, necessarily our jurisdiction, but I think East Hampton has a fantastic history of working with old buildings and finding new purposes for them, um, specifically mixed-use buildings that um, I think would really do well in the center of our city. Um, where they can support the, the businesses and the organizations that are already there and thriving. Thank you. Cindy. So when I uh, started as a committee member, I volunteered to be on the um, committee to check on the safety and the health of all of our buildings. And so what we did is go around to each and every school and take a look room by room, hallway by hallway, at the, the safety and health of the buildings. We have really old elementary schools that are really well loved. Um, the staff and teachers are doing their very best to make those um, elementary schools shine, to make the classrooms friendly. But if you look at those buildings, if you go through um, room by room, hallway by hallway, it's really, um, the buildings are in dire need of repairs, and those repairs are really costly. Then if you look at Whitebrook, that's really a failed structural idea. Um, educationally, I can tell you as a teacher and as a special ed teacher um, with kids who have ADHD, that is a really difficult, the structure of the classrooms is extremely difficult for young kids to um, focus and attend, so it impacts their education. So we have a real dire need for buildings that make sense. And the K through eight building um, makes phenomenal sense because you're going to centralize a lot of our um, administrative costs and our um, utility costs. We're also getting a chance to, um, I think it was Marissa who said, update um, and modernize the education that we're providing these kids. There are certain things we just can't do in the structures that we have because they're so old. So I am all for buildings, um, a K through eight building, and I have no idea what to do with the other <laughs> ones, but I know we'll do something great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I'm actually a member of the school building committee, and so uh, I'm obviously very much for the pre-K through eight building. 
Um, there's a number of different things it's going to allow us to do. Some have already been mentioned. Uh, it allows us to consolidate resources. It allows us to improve the classroom settings and the teaching programs for all our students, really bringing them up to a 21st century education. Um, and it, it is something that's been missed over the past number of generations, but this is an opportunity now with the funding uh, from the state that we can really can make this choice to step forward. And it's a critical time to do that. Um, it's also one of the things that we know about our current schools is that a person who choices out of East Hampton usually does that at the kindergarten level. Uh, and so it's a critical step to have a really awesome K-8 building so that those parents see the great education that they can have from the very start with their students. And then those kids are going to stay throughout the entire school, public school time. Um, and so that's going to help change the dynamic of school choice that takes too much money out of our district. Um, it's going to bring more money back in because more students are probably going to be choosing into our community from outside. Um, and all of those things between consolidation and uh, changing the dynamic of school choice is going to even more bring more money and more resources into our school district. Uh, and so that also not just means for our schools, but it'll also be for our entire community. So I think that's really, really important for us to make this step forward. Um, and uh, it also, I think one of the components of that, as people have mentioned too, is that there is going to be a cost to that. Uh, there is, we need to look at how it affects our fixed income residents, uh, but that's going to be something that we're going to be able to do, and it's something we can look at over the next year. Um, and then ultimately, yes, we've already mentioned, several of us, uh, that school, uh, that city council is the one who has the jurisdiction over what to decide to do with those buildings. Um, they are very central. There's lots of great things we can do them, but it's not going to be a part of the school committee's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Lori. Well, thank you. Um, let me start by answering the question about the existing buildings. It was fascinating for me to learn that the buildings that are older than 100 years are actually in better shape than Whitebrook at 45 years of age. So that's like unbelievable to me that that's where our energy costs are going at Whitebrook. And I also feel that um, to know that our elementary school is the oldest elementary school in the state is really a bad way of having fame for our city as well. And I'm not sure what to do with our cherished old elementary schools, but I've seen the right revitalization in East Hampton, and it's been wonderful, like what we've done with the old city hall for the arts. We could also make more housing more affordable for people of lower incomes, but that's not my expertise. But I do have to say that I fully support the new building combined pre-K through eight. And I, as I mentioned, I was on the original Manhan Rail Trail Committee, and I saw what happened with Southampton when they voted down to have the bike path. And they lost half of the federal funding, and they can't get that back now. And now they realize that they should have been connected to our beloved Manhan Rail Trail. I don't want to see that happen here. We have a wonderful opportunity with state funding that is going to be less expensive for our community to be able to build this wonderful new building. So we should act on it. And I also have, this, have experience of garnering support from the community for things like overrides. So I, re I really support the new building, but I don't know what to do with the old ones. <laughs> Thank you. I have some ideas, but I'll wait. <laughs> Marissa, you'll start this. This question is from Peter Gunn. Mm. <laughs> Determinations about bullying, harassment, and hate speech depend in part on the reasonable person's standard. Given the steady and changing development of ideas in our society, what defines reasonable is dynamic. Please provide your definition of reasonable and how should that definition be applied to the district's dress code? Great. Peter and I have had opportunities to talk about this in the past. Um, I, I like how he challenges me. Um, I think that, I guess I would start by challenging the question, only in that precisely the reason why you, we use this term reasonable um, is because it, um, 
doesn't need definition. It's something that we um, count on the goodwill and the good judgment of the people who are um, tasked with the responsibility to um, make these kind of decisions on be behalf of young people, to have an operating sense, even if we can't put to words what exactly is a reasonable person standard. Um, I think that, you know, as Peter and I have discussed in the past, um, dress code can be a surprisingly controversial issue. It can be surprisingly hard to put into language what exactly um, is appropriate and inappropriate for the school community, but certainly we know that schools all the time limit the types of expressions that um, students bring into the building, um, whether that is uh, via you know inappropriate language or hateful speech or any other kind of expression that might be detrimental to the health of the school community or distracting from learning. And um, in writing a dress code policy, I think the important thing is to uh, emphasize the goals of the dress code so that way rather than trying to outline what precise items or words or symbols are allowed or not allowed instead we are really um, proactively articulating what is it that we want in our school community what kind of expression do we value and what kind of expression um, do we prohibit because it would be damaging to the learning community and when those goals are proactively expressed then um, the hope and the expectation is that our school leaders will be able to make smart and sensitive judgments to apply those principles. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I would agree that by its nature, reasonable in this case is something divined by our society. However, I'm happy to share my thoughts on it. Um, we, I think, have in many ways lost, or maybe we didn't lose sight, maybe we never really realized from the beginning that uh, we're really all kind of the same people. Um, and it's, it can be difficult as we go through and live our lives to remember that um, just because someone else's experience um, or practices may look different, uh, really, at their core, we have we have far more in common than we have different uh, than we have different between us. Um, so, I think that reasonable is is purely being kind and accepting of the other people in our lives, uh, the other people that we share this world with. Um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, we really are at our best and uh, most accomplished when we work on things together. So um, it seems to me that reasonable uh, can mean many things, but equitable and kind. Um, and this idea of equity is, I think, maybe the most relevant to talking about the dress code. Um, I think that in my understanding of it, um, there's far more said about the clothing of uh, girls and women than there is about men, and that's not fair to them, uh, especially when, when they go to the store, the clothes that they find to wear are oftentimes uh, not in line with their dress code, um, and that should be addressed. Thank you. Cindy. Okay, I'm looking at three parts to this question. The first one is bullying. We do know what bullying looks like, and teachers in schools know what bullying looks like. We're trained in this every single year, and you have to recertify. So at the beginning of every school year, teachers have to go through a mandatory training by the state. We know, and we know the definition of what bullying is and the difference between two kids who just don't like each other and a power struggle where there's a differential and someone's actually getting bullied. Um, as far as hate speech is, is concerned, we also know what that looks like and we know what that sounds like. But I think what happens sometimes, especially in this last election period, is that hate speech um, in kids went on the rise. And sometimes staff um, in not just our school, but in other schools across the state, weren't 
comfortable responding immediately. When you hear t a hate speech, that's a teachable moment. Um, but some teachers are very comfortable in stopping the class, jumping on it right then and there, and giving a lesson on what hate speech is and how it's not appropriate. Other teachers are not as comfortable. So then it's our job as a district to teach all of those teachers, to give them the training to do this on a daily basis, because a lot of this can be stopped at the minute that it happens. If it's not allowed to grow, if you respond to it immediately in a respectful, um, well thought out way, you can teach kids that this is not acceptable and there's another way to express their opinion. But that really involves training and helping teachers to become comfortable. And I think, I think we've learned we really need to do that, and we will. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Um, as Cynthia said, I mean, there's extensive trainings that teachers go through and administrators go through in terms of both bullying, uh, really understanding how important that training is. I think that one of the things that's um, sort of a, a a highlight to our challenge right now in our own community is that the trainings that we're giving to our both our teachers and staff as well as our students is really helping all of us understand what's going on, understand bias, understand discrimination, and help people sort of take that with that sort of knowledge, be able to take the steps forward to be able to transform it. Um, you know, yes, the personal reasonable personal standard is dynamic. Um, it is based upon social contracts, uh, and so that does evolve over time. Um, and I also know that, you know, students and youth, I mean, part of that, when we were younger too, we're trying out different forms, we're trying out different words, uh, we're trying out to understand different images of who we are. Um, and so that's really critical where we have the support of a diversity officer, we have the support of teachers, other students, being able to call out things like bullying and hate speech and say, you know, that's not really what we need in our community. We do need to do something better than that. Um, and so I think that there is ways that as we talk about it more, it informs us more, it educates us about how we do need to, um, you know, maybe not try those words out or not say those words because they're not appropriate and they don't, they make some people feel very unsafe and we don't want to have anybody in our community feeling unsafe. Um, I think that the dress code component of this question uh, is a little bit more challenging. Uh, we do have to be very careful to not restrict free speech. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a fine line that we have to walk as we look at that um, because we, wanna, we do have a responsibility as a school committee to help determine what is going to help people keep them safe, but also what's going to allow us to continue to have free speech uh, for all students in our community. So it's something we have to continue to look at uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Lori. Well, I'd like to th thank Cindy for letting people know that as teachers, we are trained in bullying. As a teacher who has gone through schools for so many years, both private and public, I've seen many dress codes. But I can tell you that as a teacher, it is so important for the atmosphere of the classroom to be respectful and conducive to the learning of all. And freedom of speech, which is hate speech, is not allowed in, in the classroom. It shouldn't be allowed in the classroom. And it's very interesting with this whole controversy that came up with the Confederate flag and Confederate t-shirts, because as a teacher in public schools throughout the Pioneer Valley, I've had to tell students early in the morning, excuse me, would you put your shirt down? I can see your midriff or you're wearing a pistol on your t-shirt. You either call your parent to pick you up or you turn it inside out. So I've been dealing with this. I find that it's ironic that Peter asked this question because <laughs> as you know, he's at Williston where my husband teaches and where my own children went and they had a very strict dress code where they had to have shirts tucked in, belts, and that wasn't unreasonable. Why, is it, um, why would it be unreasonable in public schools to require there to be a semblance of respect when it comes to clothing so nobody feels intimidated? And I, as a teacher, would not feel comfortable teaching to anybody that wore anything that was inappropriate and was harmful to any student in my classroom. So 
We use these moments as teachable moments, but it's not just with dress code. I'm gonna run out of time, but I can tell you with technology, the things that I've seen with Google profiles with my teenage students are absolutely appalling. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. So reasonable person standard. I would like to think that that would be common sense, um, but unfortunately there are a lot of people who lack that. Um, it's respect for yourself, it's respect for your others, it's also, like I said, just common sense. As far as uh, dress code, I am all for uniforms. Thank you. The next question, uh, we'll start with Jonathan. Um, this question is from Kathy Lynch. Please define community partnership and give an example of a new relationship that you were willing to spearhead. And please exclude references to parent-teacher organizations. Okay. Community partnerships. Um, so a community partnership, I would define as uh, two individuals or organizations in the community partnering together. Um, I suppose in this case, it would be um, primarily the school and an outside organization. Um, as far as uh, what types of community partnerships I think I could um, lead on the school committee, uh, my background is, of course, at the library here in town. I care very much about library services, um, both um, in the public setting and in schools. Um, and I've already in my own work um, partnered with the schools. Um, I feel like I have been a community partner already in a lot of ways because of the work that I've done with the teachers, um, allowing their students opportunities to uh, come in and access a slightly broader collection and um, learn how to use a library catalog and um, learn what reputable information is. Um, however, I think some of those things are not uh, necessarily the, um, the role of the public library, um, despite the fact that I'm thrilled to be a part of that partnership. Um, so one thing that I'm very passionate about, uh, should I be elected to the school committee, is uh, strengthening the school library system um, specifically as it relates to the new K through eight building, should that come to fruition. Uh, and I feel like um, because of uh, my expertise as a youth librarian um, working here in the city already, uh, that is a partnership that could be uh, grown uh, to make sure that we have school libraries that serve our students the way that they deserve. Thank you. Cindy. Community partnership I think is crucial to um, enhancing our kids' education. There are so many things we can do. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to bring up before I run out of time first is the problem that some schools see. We have to measure how much time on learning we have on a day-to-day, -day, minute by minute basis. And teachers are, um, overwhelmed with trying to program and cover all the standards that are mandated um, for us um, each year with our kids. But what ha so what happens is sometimes we don't step out of the box. We don't realize the potential um, that we can have by drawing the community into our schools. There are so many things that community members have that they can contribute to a, a standard, be it um, someone who, when you're discussing history, who was a prisoner of war coming in and talking to students about what that was like to be a prisoner of war when you're covering that area in history. Um, having journalism and um, media um, guidance, we could use East Hampton Media to guide our kids in how to put on a, a, a news broadcast. Um, there are volunteers that can come in and help 
our students with science, math, English. There's so many things I love to see um, each and every time that a school reaches out to the community for volunteers. I know in my own school, sometimes teachers have a hard time seeing how it's going to fit in. But you, if you spend enough time brainstorming, you can figure it out, bring them in, and enhance the learning. Thank you, Cindy. Marin. Um, can you just repeat the question just to make sure I got I'd the whole happy part? To. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Please define community partnership and give an example of a new relationship that you are willing to spearhead. And please exclude PTOs. Thank you. Um, so I think that there's, when I think of community partnership, I think of two different directions. I think first of ways to bring people into the community, into the schools. Since um, Cindy already touched on a little bit of that, uh, one example that I thought was an excellent thing that happened at Maple School was having the athletes come and read to kids. Um, that was a really wonderful program that I know my son really enjoyed several years in a row. Um, so there's ways to bring in seniors, athletes, all different types of people into the schools as well as it fits into the curriculum or as after school programs. Um, I also think that it's really important to get our students out of the schools and go to uh, internships or volunteer experiences. Uh, one of my things of background was uh, when I first moved here, I was working for the Center for Ecotechnology and actually created our Eco Fellowship Program, where we'd bring in recent college graduates to be trained as community organizers and uh, sort of leaders in the community to bring energy efficiency measures and things like that back into the community. Um, and so that we can set up internship programs uh, that get our high school kids out into the community to go um, learn whatever they're interested in, find their own special niche that they want to study. Um, my son in fifth grade is already desiring to learn how to code, and so I've been trying to find a way to get him connected with people that we can go learn coding. Um, there's organizations that are out there uh, working with a lot of different age ranges, and so I think it's, it's trying to find each of those different niches and kids that want to have those experiences and help them find that. Uh, and again, it's important to either do that by going out of the schools or bringing people back into schools. Thank you. Lori. First, I'd like to applaud Kathy Lynch for already being a phenomenal community partner. What she does just by taping this event, as I said, and what she's done for the schools is really remarkable. And um, I know that I was um, away when there was the last forum about the building, the new building, so I wanted to do some more research, and I was able at 5.30 this morning to go on to East Hampton Media and see that whole forum taped and available for us. So thank you, Kathy, for that. Um, and I mentioned Williston before, and I know people are going to wonder, well, if your kids went to Williston, what are you doing like wanting to be on the school committee? And I, and I really want to say that I am totally passionate about public education, but I'm also respectful of Williston here in this community. And I think there should be a greater partnership than exists already. There already is a lot of going back and forth, and it really makes me feel wonderful because of my two worlds. And um, my son was on We the People, and he actually, his teacher was Peter Gunn. And I was so fortunate to be able to see collaboration with We the People, with Peter Gunn and Kelly Brown, and these students all in the same room, helping and supporting each other. And then I traveled to Boston with them. I would like to see more of that collaboration in our community. Um, I'm also thrilled to say that there are students from the Spanish department, Spanish classes at Williston, that go into our public elementary schools. It is extremely unfortunate that there have been so many cuts in world languages across the country, never mind in this district. And as it was mentioned, I used to teach after-school language programs at Center Pepin. And now the students are able to walk over and, ha and contribute. I'd like to foster that type of collaboration and get maybe more language speakers in this community into our schools to give kids that exposure. Thank you. Shannon. Um, the community partnership, I think, is imperative in our school system and also in our sports programs. Um, I found being in the youth cheer program, the kids tend to strive and really do well working with older um, cheerleaders. You know, when the older kids come down and, and they 
work with them. They're, they have a role model. They have somebody to look to. Um, I know that my daughter, for instance, is a hands-on kind of person. She's the kind of person that show me and I will learn so much better. Um, I think it's important to bring people into the classroom. I think it's great to have field trips to go to some of the local businesses. There are so many in town that have so much to offer that these kids could learn so much from. Um, I would definitely be willing to spearhead um, and, and help Mr. Um, Benoit in regards to the foreign exchange program. We were a part of that. Um, we had a student stay with us for 10 days from France. Um, and my oldest daughter had a chance to go to France for 10 days. It was an amazing program. And I would love to see that expand and see it grow. It was amazing. Thank you, Marissa. Okay. Thank you. Um, so many great ideas here. Um, I do remember when my son was in kindergarten, they took a bunch of walking field trips to um, the East Hampton Savings Bank and to the Biggie grocery store and to Mount Tom's ice cream. And um, it was just such a wonderful thing to watch these young children experience their town, their city, their town, and their community um, with their peers and, and to see those spaces that we would visit all the time as a family um, to see them anew through this, um, through the experience of going as a student. And I think it's um, wonderful the ways that our schools are so integrated into our community as public schools and that there are those opportunities for, um, as Maren put it so nicely, for, for people to come into the schools but also for our students to leave the schools and, and foster those connections in both directions. Um, to answer the question from um, a, a very different perspective from that, I would also mention that um, one of the community partnerships that the policy subcommittee has really been working on in the past term is the relationship between the school district and the police department. Obviously, there's a long-standing relationship there through the school resource officer position, and the policy subcommittee has recently been working on developing a new memorandum of understanding to really articulate shared goals between um, the police and the school district to make sure that um, the school resource officer position is providing us with that safe, secure school building that um, we all value, uh, while also making sure that we're protecting the civil rights of all of the students in the building. And uh, that's a partnership that is essential and critical and something that I've been really grateful to be able to work with fellow committee members and the superintendent and the chief of police um, to work toward creating a memorandum that really works for all of our students. Thank you. We'll start with Cindy on the next question, which was submitted by Mary Cerez. What is the proper role of the school committee in relationship to the superintendent? Okay. Wow. <laughs> the role Short of the school. Short question, big topic. Yeah. The role of the school committee in, uh, in relation to the superintendent. So school committees are in charge of hiring and evaluating the superintendent and the superintendent's program. So there's a lot involved. Every year um, we have to sit down and go over, um, just as teachers are evaluated by their principals and principals are evaluated by the superintendent, the superintendent is evaluated by a school committee. So Nancy or whoever the superintendent is historically would write up their goals and present them to the school committee. And we tweak them a little based on whether or not we think something needs to be added or um, subtracted from it. And they have to do with a number of very important aspects of um, being a superintendent or being a teacher. They have to do with building improvement. They have to do with culture and climate. They have to do with professionalism and student learning. So um, we look at those goals, we set up the benchmarks, 
and then we monitor, our job is to monitor um, the superintendent's progress throughout the year and um, at, at the end of the year. So it's a very time intensive, um, very specific um, uh, process. But what's important for people to know is under ed reform and under the new evaluation process, whatever we might want to evaluate a superintendent on is not necessarily what we can evaluate the superintendent on. There are really very specific guidelines. Thank you. Aaron. I don't know what else I can say after that answer. I think that's clearly somebody who's been here before. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, I think that it's very clear, uh, almost sort of like a board works with the CEO of an organization. Um, it's about that sort of hiring, evaluation, monitoring. Um, but I think it's also really critical uh, that we make sure we set up a dynamic between the school committee and the superintendent that we are not here to rubber stamp any policies or procedures or um, steps that, that the superintendent may want us to do. Um, that is really important that we do have that sort of distance to be able to uh, discuss things as we feel we need to discuss them uh, and then make decisions as we need to make decisions. So I think that it's really critical that even as you know, Cindy outlined very clearly what the sort of basics of that out role, that role uh, the two roles are and how we relate, um, it's important that we do have a collaboration uh, and that we work um, to help move our school towards a healthy and safe environment. Uh, and sometimes that means mean that people disagree, uh, but that's part of the conversation that we need to have as a school committee with our administration. Thank you. Lori. Well, there's very little left to be said now after all of that, and I, appreci I appreciate everything. Sorry. No, I appreciate everything that Cindy has said, because hopefully I will be a new member of the school committee, but that doesn't mean that I will have all the answers. And I would look to Marissa and to Cindy for their experience and expertise and directly dealing with things related to the school committee that I haven't had experience with. However, having been a teacher for so many years in different districts, I mentioned to you Amherst, I mentioned to you now that I'm in West Springfield, I was also in Hampshire Regional and I was also in Longmeadow. I have dealt with many superintendents. So one of our roles is to hire a new superintendent. I know that's not in the far future. So um, I believe that my experience working with so many different superintendents would be extremely beneficial in that hiring process. So, and Cindy also mentioned with the new ed reform, the evaluations, we're constantly going through changes in public school evaluations. So now there are more limitations for the school committee on what they could have done before when it came to the evaluation process. But I believe in open communication between the school committee and the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon. So as a new member, hopefully going into the school committee, I did go on to at Marissa's suggestion, um, the Massachusetts Association of School Committee and Kathy pretty much bulleted every single thing that is, um, or Cindy, I'm sorry, um, bullet pointed everything that is required of a school committee member. Um, I was fortunate enough at, after the last school committee, um, I sat in, on their working group um, and they were discussing the superintendent goals and it, it does take a village, it, you know, and listening to, I think it was the fourth time you guys had gone over the, um, the goals that, you know, the, the superintendent brought forward. Um, it was still in a work in progress and, you know, it's amazing what you guys do behind closed doors. <laughs> behind the scenes. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, to, to not simply repeat um, what are already rather comprehensive answers, I guess I might speak a little bit abstractly to um, the role of the school committee as a really fundamental democratic institution. 
And so far as um, public education gives us this invaluable opportunity, as all of you citizens are doing right now, to um, hear from people who have come forth out of the community because they're invested in their schools and they care about the schools and they want to represent the best interests of the young people in the community. You get to hear from us, hear our perspectives and our backgrounds and our goals, select who you would like to represent. And then that committee um, is a sounding board for you. It's a liaison. It's a place you can go if you have ideas or concerns. And in that way, public schools really do belong to the whole community, not only to the students that um, are all welcomed into the buildings every day, but to everyone who um, has a voice and has a say in shaping the, the district. Um, I think looking forward, as we do anticipate at some point um, when our current superintendent retires, we will be searching for a new superintendent. And one of the things that I think will be crucial as a school committee is to put together a search and hiring process that is really open and inclusive to the community so that way community stakeholders can um, have part, be part of that process and have say in shaping the, the vision for our, um, for our school district through really selecting leadership that is going to bring us into the future in ways that we all um, want to see. Thank you. Jonathan. What a question to pull last. Um, <laughs> I, although I think it works out because um, the question was already answered far better than I think I could have possibly answered it myself. And um, I think that that sort of speaks to the situation that we're in. Um, as Laura mentioned, several of us are going to be new school committee members, and even if we may be um, pretty informed on uh, the rules of order and how to work through a meeting, um, it's not necessarily our expertise uh, to, to know the nuts and bolts of things, and um, I think it's uh, smart on our part to look to those who already have the experience to learn, um, and perhaps by the end of a term, um, it will have become an expertise of ours. Uh, so I guess I would just speak to a, mo a moment to um, an experience of my own that I think is relatable. Um, at the library, we have a board of trustees. Um, it's not your standard public library. Um, surprise if you didn't know that. Uh, we're a private nonprofit corporation, and um, that board of trustees advises the director, hires the director, and um, if the board is uh, really aware of their role, um, they leave the day-to-day -day machinations of the library uh, up to the director and myself and the rest of the management team. And I think that that's um, very much relates to the situation here. I think that as the school committee, um, we help come up with the larger vision. Uh, we make sure that um, the path we've decided upon to reach that vision is followed. And um, on the other side of things, uh, as folks voted to this position by the public, we hear the public and incorporate their views uh, into that vision as well. Thank you. The sixth question, we'll start with Marin. Um, this is another question from Peter Gunn. Oh, no. It's shorter. Each year, damaged amounts of money leave the district in favor of charter and choice. What is the solution? The million dollar question. Charter and choice. Um, I, I do think that uh, at the conception of Charter and Choice, I think that they were started with kernels of possibility. Um, but the actual implementation of them and the budgetary impacts of Charter and Choice really damages each individual local community. Uh, and so I, I think that at a state level, this is a fundamental question for us to continue to push and to try to reframe into a, a different way of um, impacting each town. Uh, and so I think that there's a sort of two parts to this conversation. Uh, first is obviously the state level. Um, and that level, we fundamentally need to reevaluate how we uh, fund 
the charter and choice programs. Um, as a school committee member, though, and looking at how we affect in our own district here, um, I think I already mentioned that we really have to look at how can we entice people into our community and how can we keep our citizens, the, the young kids in our school district so that we don't choice them out. Um, so that, and I think in terms of doing that, as I mentioned, it's like it's most critical that we get those kids involved in our schools, involved in our programs from a very young age. If we get them enticed and see all the great benefits that they can have by staying local, uh, then they will stay local for most likely their whole time. Um, and so I think that's a fundamental place that we need to look at about keeping kids um, and not losing in terms of the choose, choice uh, money that can leave our school district. And then coming back to uh, the opportunity of this pre-K through eight building, uh, with that new building and all of the resources that we'll be able to consolidate and give all of our kids wonderful 21st century education, that is gonna help our schools really move forward uh, with a really strong stance uh, as we move forward into uh, the next round with kids and keeping them with our schools. Thank you. Lori. I'm actually very happy that Peter asked that question. In fact, I enlisted the help of Peter Gunn to help um, at a forum that I actually put together with Barbara Mataloni, the president of the MTA, and I asked Peter to be one of our keynote speakers because I know how informed he is about all the facts of what charter schools, specifically more than choicing out, are doing to our public schools. In fact, I should say quickly that the reason I got involved with the Democratic Committee is because the human resource officer at Amherst Schools said to us four years ago that the charter schools were destroying Amherst schools. And if we wanted to help, that we should become a delegate at a caucus. I had never been to a caucus before. I went to the caucus to be able to go to the state convention to have the voice of public school teachers heard. Little did I know that a year and a half later I would be asked to be chair of the committee that I went to the first caucus at. But I went because of trying to keep the money in the public schools. I do not think that all charter schools are bad. The original conception was very good but they were supposed to be a collaborative endeavor where different types of teaching and learning would be shared with the public schools. But now they siphon off funds. And I'm so happy we were able to keep the cap, but now we have a new mission and we have to help to get the foundation budget changed, which is how money is allocated in the state and it's 24 years old and they did not take into consideration the rising costs of health care for teachers nor the funding of special ed programs and there's an interesting statistic that even though massachusetts is wonderful as far as public education goes you should know that we're 48th nationally in the achievement gap between students with economic means and students without Thank you. Shana. Um, I would be curious to know and to ask the families who have decided to choice out why. Um, I do know that in some cases, our schools do not have the programming or the resources to handle some of the situations and some children do require to be choiced out. Um, I would love to hear what it is that East Hampton is lacking at this time and work to make that better. Um, <clears throat> I think having the new school is gonna be a huge, um, it's, it's gonna bring people back or keep people here, just as the high school did when it was built. Um, that was one of the reasons I moved to East Hampton was because the new high school was in the works. It was just in the beginning stages. Um, and I thought it was, you know, seeing the plans and everything else, I think that the same thing's gonna happen with the K through eight school as well. But again, I'd like to find out why and see if what it is that we can do as a school committee to improve the situations that people are saying, this is why I left. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I would start by saying that I've had some really interesting conversations with uh, 
a, a friend of mine who I respect very much who has enrolled her kids in charter school because that happens to be the right thing for her kids. And she has described how she's happy with her schools, but she feels guilty that she knows that it does have a damaging effect on the budget for public schools. And she believes in public education and wishes that there was some way that she could both you know, have this um, opportunity that's right for her kids while also um, be supportive of the public education system. And so I think given that that is the reality that we're currently at, um, we need to be advocating for change at the state level. And that's formally outside of the required duties of the school committee, but I think that school committees have a lot of potential to be organizing bodies as we can um, educate the public about these issues and how they affect our communities. And we can form coalitions with committees across the, the state to really have our vo voices heard um, by our representatives. I'm gonna check my time here and see how much more I can dive into. Um, the committee has in the past term um, made some efforts in this direction. Um, many of us were active participants in the No On Two campaign. Um, we've met with a member of the Department of Education board to talk to him directly about what is it that we can do to um, encourage the state to make the changes necessary so that way this system isn't so draining on public school budgets. Um, you know, I, I have been following the news about Governor Baker's appointed chair of the board, Paul Sagan, who has funneled over a half a million dollars into a dark money organization to support the no, the the pro-charter side of the no, of the question two campaign last year, um, alongside heirs from the Walmart family and a number of other wealthy investors from out of the state. So we certainly need to be considering what are the motivations there at the state level um, when when these, this is the structure in place. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks. Uh, so I think as we've gone around the table so far. Um, it seems like uh, this is both an easy question and an incredibly difficult question. It seems like there's uh, certainly some parts that are within our control, but um, other parts that uh, sort of exist on a level uh, beyond the school committee um, and what we're um, accomplishing on a month-to-month on a -month basis. Um, but I think advocacy is absolutely an important uh, thing to, to consider in this case is um, future budgets are, are drawn up for the state uh, and money is, is, de is determined where that money is going to go. Um, I believe it was mentioned uh, maybe by Marin, um, the importance of getting the, the kids in, into our schools early and um, their families passionate about those schools early. For better or worse, people make, um, people make, people put a lot of weight into first impressions and uh, in my own work, I've overheard parents talking about uh, their trips into Maple School and um, respecting the work that the teachers do, but just not feeling like that school is the right setting for their children. Uh, so they're considering um, a neighboring community or uh, the charter schools in our area. So I think that a great first step is absolutely um, building and pursuing this K through eight school. I think that if we can, if we can wow the young families right off the bat, then um, they're more apt to stick with the system uh, moving forward. And um, we already have a great new high school in place um, to make them, you know, to give them something to look forward to as well. Uh, if we could, you know, find some way to maybe support uh, even pre-K education uh, here in town, um, I think that, that that could go a long way towards accomplishing that same goal. Thank you. Cindy. I wish I had 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, you I'll, have two. I'll do this as fast as I can. Um, let's start with choice. We have really old buildings. We have really great teachers. What we need to do as a district is advertise and showcase the great education and the great teaching that's going on in this in this city. A lot of times people make the judgment, Marin's right, people don't, they choice their kids out before they even hit kindergarten. Part of that reason is you look at old buildings, you assume that this is gonna be a lousy education for your kids. We need to spend some time 
really advertising, interviewing, showcasing all of our teachers. Peter does a really nice job of talking about the great things that are going on in Kelly Brown's classroom. We need to do that for all the teachers that are doing a super job. There are great elementary school teachers. I went in and read for Dr. Seuss Day. I had a blast and I was so enchanted by the strength and the manners and the behavior and the learning and the intellect of those kids. We need to showcase those teachers. That'll bring school choice dollars back. As far as charters concerned, our school committee has really actively worked to um, uh, bring back money to the public school system and fight uh, the no on, fight for the no on two. Uh, charter schools, people don't realize they're not really public schools. They use public school dollars, but they are not held to the same standards that public schools are held to. So they don't provide equal services for all of the kids in a district. They find different ways to pick and choose. That's the problem I have with charter schools. We are teaching everyone and charter schools are not teaching the same types of kids. They are shutting certain kids out and that's just not right. Thank you. Candidates, you've been very economical with your time and we have time for one more question before we go to closing remarks. Um, I did want to mention that um, there was a question that was submitted by the East Hampton Education Association that relates to other questions and so we aren't using it, but their statement I think is important on that topic. According to uh, an independent study commissioned by the Commonwealth, public schools in Massachusetts are underfunded by over $1 billion annually. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible place to be trying to educate public children in public schools without adequate funding. We're going to start back with the same rotation we did with the first question for this last question. This question is submitted by Casey Corsello. Who is responsible for the vision of the district? And how do we ensure that that vision is consistent amongst all the schools? It's a good question. I believe that the community should determine the vision. I think that the school committee, as part of the community, the educators, the students, everybody has to think what we want for our schools here in East Hampton. That's why we need to build a new school. We need to keep people in our schools so they will not choice out, so more funds will not leave. And I feel that there should be dialogue and with the 10 point plan, I really like that there is community collaboration and I'm not sure if all of the people have applied to be on <coughs> that specific committee to be able to give input into what's going on here in the schools. But the collaboration for a vision is what I think is most essential. So we have a lot of things facing East Hampton right now. But a lot of these things are so extremely exciting and positive. The fact that we have the opportunity to build a new K through eight school that will support 21st century learning is amazing. But we have to bring everyone on board, including people that have limited income. They need to be part of the vision as well. So they have to understand that there's an increase in taxes it's going to be difficult for many. It's going to be difficult for me and my husband. We're both teachers. But we know that we have to look to the future, not right now. We have to think about our city for future generations with a, with a school that's going to support the learning that they deserve. So the vision needs to be shared by all, but I think the school committee can help guide it. Thank you. Shannon. Um, I would have to agree with Lori. I believe that um, the community would be the one that would collaborate. I would think with us as the school committee on the vision of what our school district should look like. Um, I think it's important to hear everybody's vision, not just 
one group of people, one small group of people, one large group of people. It needs to be a, a large group. Um, I think it would be the role of the school committee to possibly make that um, vision a reality um, with the collaboration of you know the superintendent, the administrators of each building um, and communicate that to all community members. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't wanna echo too completely here, but I, I absolutely agree that, um, and I've, I've mentioned it before, but I, you'll hear me mention it over and over because I really do believe in it. Um, public schools belong to us. They're made better by our participation and we all get to um, have our have our voices heard in terms of what we want when visioning the future of our district, and so um, I think that that's a it's a mutually shared responsibility among all of us. In the past six months or so, um, as we've been going through challenges, we've heard from a lot of people in the community, and we've had um, school committee meetings that were were packed and had long um, public speak sessions. And while we were all drawn together um, in, a, in a moment of um, concern and challenge, uh, what was really invigorating and reassuring and heartening about the experience over the past six months is to see that the community does come together because the community does care about the schools. And so I hope that looking forward, um, as, we, as we do the good hard work of overcoming these challenges and transforming our district into um, a really welcoming, inclusive, and equitable district that we all want it to be, that that kind of participation and that kind of community engagement can continue. Um, it's, we're, we're open to you as a school committee, and um, we value the input of, of you all as um, members of the city. Yeah, I think so. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, um, I very much believe that we are stronger and more accomplished when we work together. And I think that this question and the situation that it alludes to is no different. Um, as everyone has said, uh, developing the vision is a collaborative effort. It's something that um, everybody needs to say in, um, especially if they want it, even if they don't. And um, as someone who has uh, worked already with folks from every level of the school system, I feel like I'm in a unique position to uh, make that happen and to uh, hear the needs of, of the parents and the students and the teachers and the administrators and to help them all come together uh, in a common goal and vision. Um, again, I. I have a background in communication that makes me uh, very much focused on on hearing all of these needs um, and and coming to you know one conclusive uh, path forward uh, through them and um, that's something I'd very much like to bring to the school committee uh, given the opportunity. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, um, vision statements are supposed to begin with students and teachers sitting down and deciding what the vision of the school is. Then it's guided by administrators and it goes out from there. Um, vision, the vision of our district really is, um, it needs to be a part of everybody's job. From the students, the teachers, the administrators, community members, everybody has to pitch in. Um, as far as community um, is concerned, I began as a school committee member going out to um, every building as soon as I got elected. And I met with uh, the administrators to begin with to see what their vision was. Then informally, I met with teachers to find out what their vision was. From there, I went to students. And that gave me a good basis for what was going on in the community and where people wanted to go. And then after March, when everything kind of erupted, we started something. Um, different school committee members went out into the um, district 
And we met with parents, some of them very, very angry in the beginning, um, really needing to talk and be heard. And I found that so satisfying. Um, we were able to come to agreements, sometimes these hostile coffees that we began with, where I thought my stomach was really gonna clench. By the end of the time when we were talking, things were pretty stable and we had come to a vision of working together. So one of the things I wanna do as a school committee member is continue that. I wanna start coffee once a month where everybody knows where to find me they can come and tell me what's on their mind so that I can continue to understand everybody's vision. Thank you. Mary. I think one common thread here is very clearly collaboration. Um, collaboration comes from, to be able to develop the vision, comes from students, comes from parents, comes from community. Um, and I think that one of the wonderful things about the school committee is that uh, we meet 24 times a year. Right? So there's many opportunities for people to come forward, to come join us. Uh, and if you're not able to come join us, there's correspondence read at, every, at school committee. So if you're not able to make it in person, you can still send in a message. And that kind of collaboration, not just when there's eruptions or tension, but even just throughout the year, uh, it's an important way for, for community members to come in and be a part of the ongoing development of our vision as a community. Um, I think one of the things to take a different piece on this, though, was also the question asked about consistency. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a challenge right now within our community. Um, we have three different elementary schools. There isn't consistency always there. There isn't the same programming offered there. Uh, and so some of that will obviously be dealt with if we are given the opportunity to have a single school uh, for our pre-K through eight. Uh, but even right now, with the three schools that we have, we can work on making sure that there are common programs, that they do have the, the great whether it's the Athletes Coming to Read program that happens at Maple or some of the different um, gardening programs that happen at different schools, making sure that, that schools do have all those opportunities, that we do find ways to give all of our kids equal opportunities across all of our different schools uh, is an important part for us to continue to work on the consistency of implementation of our policies and our vision. Uh, but really, the vision is all of us, and so Regardless of myself getting elected or not, all of us need to be involved. All of us come forward and be a part of this, uh, again, through writing or being in person at all the different school committee meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Well, candidates, we've come to the, the last part of this conversation, and that's your one-minute closing statements. And we're going to begin with Marin and go across to Lori. Okay, thank you all so much for coming out tonight, for watching online. Uh, we live in a growing, diverse community that demands equality and respect for everyone. Each of us brings unique experiences, whether we've lived in this town and city all our life or whether we just recently arrived. This variety is exactly what makes this city a vibrant pace that people want to come and be a part of. If elected to the school committee, my first priority is to make certain that the three-year school culture and climate initiative and its 10-point plan is given the proper leadership and support it requires to succeed. I will make certain that students are in the forefront of this conversation and that their voices are heard throughout the process. To make the necessary systemic changes, I promise to dive deeply into reviewing and revising the policies that govern bullying, discrimination, and others that help keep our schools safe and focused on learning. At this pivotal moment in our community, inspired by our high school students, I offer myself to be of service to this community, to make certain that we utilize these challenges to grow stronger and teach all of our students the skills necessary to be successful global citizens in the 21st century. Thank you, and I hope I can vote on your vote. I can count on your vote in November. Thank you. Cindy. Okay. I loved being on the school committee for the last two years. Um, even though the end of the year was a little rocky this time, um, it was really satisfying to contribute to um, the district, to learning. As a teacher, it's really important that to me that we support public schools and that all our public schools are as healthy um, and vibrant as they can be. 
Um, I was really honored to um, work side by side with some great school committee members. I will tell you that we worked really as a team and there is not a single member who um, served for the last two years who did not work their tail off for the good of the district. So I was really, really proud to be part of that team. I just hope that uh, I have another two years to see all the visions, to see our 10 point plans and all of um, our hopes come true and to monitor and be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So thank you again to the folks who put this event all together. Uh, thanks to all of you who are watching here and online. It's so important uh, for you to be a part of this process. Um, even in this off election year, um, it's here on the local level that, that I think voting uh, makes the biggest, the biggest impact. Um, so I implore all of you, uh, whoever you vote, choose to vote for, uh, to, just, to just go out and vote and, and be a part of this. Um, but of course, um, I do ask that uh, you consider voting for me um, on November 7th. Um, I am dedicated to open and honest communication and inclusive leadership that I think is uh, absolutely paramount in this uh, trying time for our schools. Uh, but despite the challenge, there's opportunity to, before us, um, and I'm thrilled about the opportunity to be a part of that. Um, and I look forward to your vote uh, in November. Thank you. Marissa. Great. Um, well, it's been great to share in conversation tonight with so many thoughtful candidates. Um, we know that our new committee will have at least four new members. And I remember the steep learning curve um, in the early, early months of my first term. And uh, so I think one thing that I would offer to the committee in the coming term would be an experienced perspective and institutional knowledge. I'm glad Cindy is running as well. She has a, um, a great insight on our schools. And um, at the same time, I would be very excited to work with everyone here and um, to, to have those fresh perspectives on the committee. I am committed to East Hampton. I believe in our schools. We have skilled and caring teachers and we have kind and curious kids. And I think we have a really bright future ahead. Um, it's been an honor to serve in this past term and I, I thank the people of East Hampton for that privilege. And I thank you also for your consideration this November. Thank you, Shannon. I'd like to thank everybody from East Hampton Media and also everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I have a really hard time public speaking as if you hadn't noticed, I was the reason we got an extra question. Um, please, I ask all of you um, to see me at the speakeasy. I am much better at giving you my, <laughs> at giving you my perspective. My parents left for crying out loud. I was doing so bad. So, <laughs> um, I am for the kids, that's why I'm here. Um, I want to be a part of the change. I want to be a part of the future of East Hampton. Um, I'm used to working with kids. I love kids. I love my kids. I want my daughter to have the best experience possible in the last two years of her school here at EHS. Um, I have a lot to offer. I have a business background. Um, I'm a team player. I work well with others. and. Now I run out of time. And I've enjoyed everything you had to say. <laughs> and I have to tell all of you, it's extremely daunting being here in front of you and knowing that we're being taped and we're being you know, saved for anyone to look at and scrutinize at any time. I public speak all the time and I think I was most terrified at this event. And I feel that I haven't been articulate and I've stumbled. I don't even think I answered the first question but I believe it's because I'm so passionate about education. And I have to tell you, I had something prepared, but I wanna speak from my heart. I've thought about running for school committee for quite some time. I actually put my hat in around five years ago when there was an interim position. It's not something I take lightly. 
And I mentioned to Dr. Perron that I was going to run for school committee when the school year started in, in Westside. And I know he's very revered. And today I saw him after our professional development day, and I was nervous about tonight. And I said, Dr. Perron, you said I would be great for the school committee in East Hampton. And he said, yes, you would, Laurie. And I said, well, please tell me why. And he said, because you always put the kids first. And this position will give you a broader lens to do so. And I hope I have your vote in November to show you how committed I am to making our schools the best they can possibly be. And I think a teacher perspective, as Cindy said, with the other experience that we have of people sitting here would help our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. Thank all of you for your time, attention, and wonderful words tonight. I think that this is going to be a wonderful forum for voters to take a look at, to try to make a decision as, a, as to who the new members of the school committee will be. There will be at least five new members, including the mayor. Um, and so the school committee is a very important committee here in East Hampton, and we want to thank all of you that came, those of you that are watching at home. I want to remind everyone that at 8.30 this evening, we're going to hold a speakeasy at Mill 180. That's an opportunity for the citizens to talk about issues and to talk about ideas. The candidates certainly are going to be there if they choose to come. You're welcome to have a conversation with them if you'd like, but this is not a candidate forum. This is a public forum. It's for the citizens. So those of you that are watching at home, Mill 180, 830 this evening, Pleasant Street. I want to thank everyone. I want to extend my gratitude to East Hampton Media and the school department for both putting this on and for the wonderful facility that we have here. And Marin, after the meeting, I want to talk to you about the school building committee. Thank you all, and a round of applause for the candidates. <laughs>